you know, I really can't think of anything that I would rather do than what I'm doing here. Do you know that? I love to preach. I love to share the gospel. I love to see people understand. And I love to prepare because as I prepare, I learn too, and that, that's so good. Uh, someone has said, the most becoming garb of truth is simplicity. The most becoming garb or dress of truth is simplicity. In the book of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, we read this. The Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians, and we're not going to stay here, but I just want to read this. He said, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that there is in Christ. Somehow, I, I think there is something that permeates our thinking uh, at, on occasion that says if it isn't complex, it really isn't valuable. I don't believe that. Years ago, uh, about the time that, uh, that computers were becoming popular, my wife and I drove back to Rochester, Minnesota, where we pastored years ago. And while we were there, uh, someone said, the Mayo Clinic has just installed a whole floor of computers. Would you like to see it? And so we said, why, well, that sounded great. So we, we went up to the Mayo Clinic and up on whatever floor it was, and we walked in, and here was this, this large room that had a false floor, and the room was filled with wheels and lights and all kinds of things, and they told it, began to tell us all these wonderful things that these computers were doing. And I made this comment. I said, what kind of a mind could conceive something like this? And the man said, oh, not one mind, many minds working together with a lot of small things that eventually put them together. But they said computers are not complex, except as we look at the, at the whole unit. Well, you know, the, uh, the gospel is kind of that way. Uh, there is a very real sense in which it is so, it is so complex. We, we look at it and we, some, uh, sometimes I think we're almost reluctant to even talk about it because we're afraid that somebody will realize how little we know about, about the truth of the gospel. However, there are also the times when we see the, the simplicity of it and we say, Hey, a, a child can understand. And that's one of the things that's wonderful. If the child is come, or the, the gospel is complex enough that it can stagger the minds of, of great men. And it is simple enough that a child can understand. And I love that. Probably one of the best known Old Testament scriptures in, in its simplicity is Psalm 23 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Did you hear about the little girl who was going to give that recitation in, in the Christmas or in the program at church? And she said, the Lord is my shepherd. And she got frightened and she said, the Lord is my shepherd and that's all I want. <laughs> well, friend, out of the mouths of babes, when we have Jesus Christ as our shepherd, we have him as our savior. We have him as our life, and we find that he is profoundly productive in many, many areas. Probably the, one of the best-known New Testament uh, scriptures would be uh, John 3.16. And of course, let's say it together. Can we do that? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When did you learn that? How long ago did you learn it? Third grade? Maybe even before that, just as a child we learned. And this is such a profound truth, and it is so simple that anyone can understand it. But you know, 
one of the probably the second that most uh, understood or used scriptures is found in the book of Ephesians. And when I think of, of this verse, I always think of you, George, uh, and you'll see right, you won't see right now, but you will in a few minutes, which reads, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We use it as I, uh, Tony, the other evening, as you and I were sharing in the fellowship hall, I know that I use that verse. For by grace are you saved through, through believing, not of yourself, it's a gift. Am I right? We, we talked about that. It's a, it's a wonderful truth. Actually, it, it, it should read, for by grace have you been saved. Now, the reason for that is because the Apostle Paul is writing to a group of believers who have trusted Christ. And so he said, you were saved on the principle of grace through simply believing, uh, through faith. Well, as we think of this, to the, uh, to the man outside of Christ, now, do you know what that means? To the man who has never trusted Christ, to the man who has never, never uh, had anybody explain the gospel, to the man outside of Christ, we have to say this, there are none righteous. There are none righteous, none. We have to say, there are none that understand. None, un and I, this is, is I, I don't know that I could prove it from scripture, this is, is sort of a, of a philosophy that I have. If a man understands and rejects, it has to mean he's demented. I can't imagine anyone who understands the simplicity and the power of the gospel who would say, no thanks. No, that, that's not uh, what I want. So to receive Christ is a gift. And by the way, we're going to be talking about some very simple facets of truth. I used to think that, that, that you know, that we should impress people with our vast store of wisdom and understanding. <laughs> Not so. Let's impress people with the simplicity of the gospel message. How does that sound to you? Just right down here. I, I, I've said this for years, and I believe it. The gospel is not caviar and crackers. The gospel is meat and potatoes and gravy. Amen. Uh, would you agree with that? It, you know, it's just down here where we live. It, it's just everyday stuff, only it's the power of God to everyone that believes. So to receive Christ means that we understand, or do we? Well, we understand a little bit. <laughs> we understand that, that grain of mustard seed. We understand that God loves me. We understand that I'm a sinner. We understand that the price of my guilt has been paid. We understand that if I call upon him, he has promised to come. I understand that. But the apostle tells us over in the book of Ephesians that uh, in the a verse verse 7 of chapter 2, that God is going to take the ages of eternity to expound, to explain more and more what a magnificent thing we have when we have Jesus Christ. So I have to say, with, and be careful, I have to tell you though, then that we, we understand and still we don't. We understand a little bit. But Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 uh, oftentimes would be more practical and it would be understood in a, in a broader sense if we could uh, somehow uh, grow in our understanding. There has to be more and there, there is more. Let me ask you this question. Why do I need a savior? Why not just a, a set of standards? Why not just a set of principles? Why do I need a savior? Why must my salvation be pure grace? Why not, why not give man a little, a little opportunity to, to get in there and, and help out just, just a little bit? Well, of course, first of all, we, we have to say, well, God loves us. And of course, that's absolutely true. That goes without saying almost. But then we have to go back to verse 1 of chapter 2 of Ephesians. And here's where we're going to spend a fairly good amount of time tonight. Ephesians chapter 2, and here we read, 
and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. You know, the word quicken means you hath he, now is it time past, you hath he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. Here is the biblical declaration as far as what dead men do. Verse 1 of chapter 2 Ephesians says that they were dead in trespasses and sin. And then it tells us that they were walking according to this world's standards. And if you think that's good, turn on your television or your radio or anything you want to turn on and you'll find that this world's standards have gone south a long time ago. You will find in those three verses that not only were, is man walking by this world's standards, but he is circumscribed by the prince of the power of the air who is none other than Satan himself. And Satan, as you well know and as I well know, he is, he is the father of lies. He is one who can appear and, as an angel of light and he can also appear as a roaring lion. And he is the, cause, the root cause of all the hurt and the heartache and the agony and the death and the sorrow and all that is horrid and nasty and, and devastating. It all can be laid at his door. So the unsaved man is walking according to the, the subscribed uh, circumstance ar ar around the, the will and the purpose of the prince of the power of the air. Then we read that all of these natural children are children of disobedience. All these people are actually children of disobedience. And they are all represented by Adam. Now, Adam goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. You know, you remember the story. But mark this down. Adam was my representative way back in the Garden of Eden. And when Adam decided to reject the will of God, when he decided to go contrary to the will of God and to the word of God, and he reached out and took whatever that fruit was that his wife offered him, Adam became a sinner. And because he was my representative, I get some of the same credit. I am also listed as a sinner and therefore in need of a savior. So interesting. Now let me ask you something, or tell you something first. I am a sinner by birth because of my identification with Adam. I am also sinful by choice, by choice. Sin can be fun, it can be challenging, it can be exciting. You knew that, didn't you? Is that news? No, that's not news. I knew it wasn't. Let me ask you this, though. What do we expect of the dead? What do we expect of the dead? Nothing, absolutely nothing. A dead man, a dead anything is dead. And there is nothing quite so dead as that which is dead. What does God expect of the dead? Same thing, absolutely nothing. Why do we need a savior? Why do we need a source of life? Because man is dead in trespass and in sin by nature. Years ago, somebody gave me a little gospel tract that said, what must I do to go to hell? And I opened it and there was nothing there. Because that's exactly what we have to do to go to hell, nothing. We're on our way, automatically, because of Adamic sin and because of personal sin. So we need, to, we need to, to realize that. So something that we do also need to realize, and that is this. We do not need, the unsaved man does not need a code of ethics. 
He does not need that sort of thing that the law was given, but only with one purpose, or primarily one purpose, and that was to expose man's need of a savior. Amen. So when we, when we give the unsaved man a coat of, of Christian ethics, what we are actually doing is trying to revive that which is dead. And that's impossible. What the dead need is life. And if life ever comes into the body of a dead person, it's going to have to come from someplace else. It is not going to come from within. Does that make sense? All of this is a part of the, of the simplicity of the gospel. Well, so the first three verses expose this, and then verse four begins, and I love this, but God, <laughs> but God, man by nature is dead in trespass and in sin. He is walking according to the courts of this world. He is dead, he is without hope, he is without God, but God, and that is a pivotal term. That means he was going one direction, but now, there is a change and he is going in a different direction. Here we read, but God who is rich in mercy. We hear a lot about the wealthy today, the, the rich guys that need to be taxed more, you know, all this sort of thing. Well, let me tell you something. God is wealthy beyond description. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in every mind. He owns a whole bunch more stuff than I can ever, ever imagine. He is rich in mercy. And what that is, he is rich. He looks and he sees man in his hurt. He sees man in his agony. He sees man in his sorrow, in his hopelessness. And he is rich in his mercy and reaches out to gather that one to himself. But God who is rich in his mercy for his great love, great love, wherewith he loved us. I've got to tell you just a quick little story. This, I'm not going to go into it except this afternoon I, I walked up to the dollar store, which is not, I love dollar stores by the way. Uh, walked up to the dollar store and as I was coming out there were three uh, people that were standing there uh, they needed a bath uh, you know that sort of thing and he came up to me and I, I didn't have any money so I, I said and I, I've thought about doing this before I said tell me uh, has anybody ever told you that God loves you and he said do you know the Ten Commandments and I said, yes. He said, name one. I said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. He said, good, let's talk. He said, I've had so many people try to rattle off some kind of religious garbage to me, quote unquote, that, and I'll say to them, do you know the 10? No, well, I didn't. He said, I, I mark them off. So I had the opportunity of, of sharing for 20 minutes with, this, with three street people, and it was a delight. I just had a great time. But it is his mercy that reaches out to people who are hurting, and it is his grace <coughs> pardon me, that reaches out to man in his sin. So it is the mercy of God, and it is the grace of God. And the wonderful thing is, he is rich in mercy and grace, and he is rich in love. He loves his creation. And then we read, even when we were, verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ. People don't seem to realize this. God doesn't give me a little box of life and say, I don't lose it, Lyle. He simply takes me to himself and hugs me to himself. And so his life is infused into my heart. And it's such a wonderful thing uh, to realize this. So he has made us 
the believer, made us alive because of his mercy, which is seeing man in his need, and because of his grace, which sees man in his sin, he's done this, and then he, verse, the latter part of verse 5 says, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Let me tell you something. The only thing good that I have I have because of him with whom I have given my life. Jesus Christ. He is my, I don't have anything else. Take away Jesus Christ, what do you have? Not one thing, zilch, end of discussion. No good, no good at all. So he made us alive, the believer alive, because of Calvary, because of the work of the cross. So how does he do this? He unites us to Christ. You know. Uh, during the years that I, I'll say during my more productive years, I gave blood. I gave every, I, in fact, I had a 20-gallon thing that I'd given a lot, that's a lot of blood. Not all at once. <laughs> but, you know, and then, uh, and then a few years ago I had a problem, and, uh, and I had to get some of that back, and so I had uh, some blood uh, transfusion into my body. But, you know, the interesting thing is, there is blood in my body that wasn't mine. There is life in my body that wasn't mine. I don't know who it belonged to, red, yellow, black, white, I don't care. But it was O negative blood and my body accepted it and I am enjoying the benefits of it. So God saves us, he makes us alive by uniting us with him. For by one spirit, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. I become, his life is a, is a part of me. And I, I thrill to the reality of that. So I am saved by his life. And this is, is Romans 5. Five, verse, I think verse 10, we are saved by his life. He was, he was resurrected after his death and he is saved by his life. I am saved by his life being placed into me. Just exactly how important is Christ? Well, without him, I don't have life. Without him, I am just a corpse. Without him, I have existence. Oh yes, I exist but you don't live until you have Jesus Christ because there is no life apart from him. Well, uh, what exactly was accomplished by Calvary? And you know, here I, I could take, we probably should, I don't know, it could just go on and on and on. What was accomplished? When I was declared righteous, Romans 5, 1, when you, when you place your faith in Christ, Tony, when you placed your faith in Christ the other night, God put his righteousness to your account. And you have a standing with God based upon the absolute righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's about as good as you can get, I would, it would seem to me. I have been united with Christ, baptized into one body with him. I have been accepted by him. He knows all about me. My ups and downs, the whole nine yards, and that's not very good. He knows the whole thing, but because of Calvary, I am accepted because he has placed me in Christ Jesus. I am sealed by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. God the Holy Spirit took and sealed me right smack dab into that body, never to be loosed, never to be loosed. And then may I tell you, the scripture says that when, I, when you receive Christ, Tony, when I received Christ way back in 1949, I became a new creature. I became a new creation in Christ. Now I want to ask you a couple of questions and I don't know if I want you to answer them carefully or not. I'm just going to ask them, do we want to do? Do I look, I'll stick up my chest and pull in my stomach. Do I... <laughs> Is that the way you do it, or do you stick your stomach out and pull in your chest? I'm not sure. <laughs> do I look like a new creature in Christ? 
Not really. Not really. Tell me this, do you? Do you look like a new creation in Christ Jesus? Probably not. Do I always act like a new creation in Christ? Every now and then. <laughs> but certainly not as often as it would be good if I did or if I, uh, if I could. You know, there's a song that we, we haven't sung it here, and I'm delighted that we don't. I don't understand it. Tell me if you do. It goes, take time to be holy, Sunday between 9 and 12. Do I take time to be holy two hours a week? Have you ever tried to be holy? Have you ever tried to be holy? Wow, it is a chore. And it, it's basically a chore because you can't do it. How then do I know that I am a new creation in Christ? Simple. God said it. That's it. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a new creation in Christ Jesus. And let me tell you something, and I love this. I am what God says I am. Now, I don't care what you say. You may, you may see some of the flaws and things that the pimples and warts and this that I have. That's okay. But God says when you place your faith in Christ, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And guess what? That's where I am. How do I know? The book. The book. But listen, uh, there's more. <laughs> there's more. All tied up in, in Ephesians 2 and 8, verse 8 and 9. The scripture goes on and says, By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should be braggadocious, John. <laughs> John and I have a little in-house, we like that word braggadocious. It sounds very impressive, doesn't it? Uh, not of works, lest we, any man should boast. For, verse 10, for we are his workmanship. Now I'm going to say that again and put a little different emphasis. For we are his workmanship. Who? Who is we? The believer. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That's where we have life. Created in Christ Jesus into pre-planned good works. You like that, George? Absolutely. Into pre-planned good works. I knew, I knew that there had to be a catch. That's what I hear people say. No, oh, there's a catch. Yeah, now you're going to tell me all the things I got to do and all the things I don't got to do and all these things. I knew there had to be a catch. But let me tell you something. Let's back up just a little bit and say this. The workmanship is simply the amazing truth that God could take a man like me, or like you, Tony, or George, or uh, Greg, is it? Or like Greg, or, that, that God do, could take a man like me, reach out to him in mercy, grab hold of him by grace and make him into that which is totally accepted to a holy God. It takes the workmanship of God to do a thing like that. Does that make sense? In fact, the, the word here is actually, he is, the believer is God's masterpiece. The very best that he could do. The most wonderful thing. So tonight there is no reason for anyone ever to step into eternity without hope.
to step into eternity with no assurance. There's no reason. Because the price has been paid. And I, I love this. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us this. That uh, it speaks about, it says, Looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What, you, what was he saying? He was saying, God is tickled pink with his masterpiece. He is joyful that the cross was so totally successful that whosoever will may come. Thrilled. And all this is from Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. But listen. Good works. Good works. Did you know there was a song? I, I saw it one time. I've never sung it publicly. It has one word. Work. Work, 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 work. What, what a thrill. Well, that's invigorating, isn't it? Is that what the Christian life is? Just work, 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 work? Well, <laughs> not really, but here's what I hear. Okay, uh, let's begin with you. First, uh, yeah, begin with, not me. I, I'm up here, so I'm taken care of. But let's begin with you. You want to start being kind. And then you want to start being gracious. And then you better start getting generous. And then you better start loving people. Because if you don't love people, you'll never reach them. You start loving people. And then you start doing away with envy. And then you start doing away with pride. And then gossip. You start trying to be a new person. Did you know in the context that I'm sharing with you, there is no time when the word try is in Scripture? Try to do this, try to do that. No, no. There's the trial of your faith, things like that. But in this context, there are none that use it. Have you ever tried... Oh, I have. And you know, when I try to be loving, everybody knows whether I'm fake or not. When I try to be generous, I do it, but boy, I'll tell you, it's so hard. You know, give that extra buck when I had something else I wanted to do with it. I'll be frank with you. When it comes to these things, the faster I go, the behinder I get. I'm just not successful. I've tried and I've tried, and I've tried, and I failed, and I failed, and I failed. But let's go to the scripture. What did the scripture say? Well, there were, there were those that came to John or to Jesus and said, "What shall we do?" John six twenty nine. What shall we do that we might do the works of God? Let's let's find out how to do the work of God. And you know what the answer was? They said. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom God hath sent. This is what God wants you to believe, the just shall live by faith. He wants you to realize that we have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son and that we are living on a totally different plane than we ever were living on before. And then we need to realize this. You don't turn a crank and get more faith. You don't try to conjure up more faith. The scripture says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we need to be men and women and young people of the word of God. We need to be men and women who begin to live in the book, begin to find out that here is the source of my everything that, that's, that's worth having. It was the apostle Peter who said this, being born again, 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, emphasis seed, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. By the word of God. Being born again, that's when you come to Christ, 
being born again, not of, not of flesh and blood, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. How? The word of God. This is why your salvation is complete, because it's not something that I've conjured up. It's not something that you've done. That It's by the word of God. Now, I want, I want the same things God wants. Here's what I want. I want love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance. Do you like those? Do you like the sound of those? That's what the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. No. The thing is, you and I don't have to try to produce that. Listen, how do you get an apple tree? How do you get an apple? Well, you have to have an apple tree. No, you don't begin with an apple tree, do you? How do you begin getting an orchard of apple trees? You begin with a seed. And somebody plants that seed and then they water it and they nurture it and it grows up and it grows and it grows. And, and one day it becomes a tree and one day it blossoms and blooms and carries on and one day it has apples. So apples come from having good seed. When you receive Christ as your Savior, God placed you in Christ, the seed of the Spirit of God. God, the Holy Spirit, lives in you as a believer in Christ. He lives in me. And as I grow, as I live in the book, as I find out what I have, the day comes, and I, 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 don't, even think, I don't even think about loving you. You just do. <laughs> Isn't that amazing, Catherine? You, you just do. You don't think about serving people. Oh, let me see. I better please God and go out and do something for her. No. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. This is what God wants for us. And you know the interesting thing? We look at an apple and we can count the seeds in it. But God can look at a seed and count the apples in it. One little seed produces oh, all kinds of wonderful things. And God placed his seed in you when you trusted Christ as your Savior. And these years, these days, these months, days, weeks, whatever it is, have, it has been doing a work, accomplishing a work. And who knows how many apples have come because of his work in you. And we haven't tried to do it ourselves. It's not me. So I don't have, I have nothing to, to, to boast about. I, I can't be braggadocious. To, I'm not in the least. I have nothing to brag about. I'm the clay. He's the potter. And as we realize this, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Now that doesn't mean my joy. It means his joy. God is so happy with the fact that he has done everything necessary to present you faultless before his presence forever. And he is so happy with the fact that as you grow in Christ, he knows that the fruit of the Spirit is going to be, begin to be evidenced in your life. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, and we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works before the foundation of the world. What works? The works accomplished as God the Holy Spirit is able to function in and through us. It's not me trying to merit something with God. Let's bow together, shall we? Father, thank you for the privilege of being here this evening. Dismiss us, our God, with thy blessing and benediction. We pray in Jesus' name.